you very much. Yes, yeah, so I'm Megan. I'm an engagement officer for Butterfly Conservation. Um, and I'm really, really pleased to see all your lovely faces today because I thought on the way here, I was like, oh, it's lovely and sunny. No one is going to come to a butterfly talk. So it's really great that you've all decided to uh, join us. And yeah, so I'm going to be talking about butterflies. I've also squeezed in a little bit about moths, um, as you'll see as we go through as well. So just to introduce ourselves, really, um, for those that aren't familiar with butterfly conservation, um, we are a UK charity dedicated to the conservation of butterflies, moths and our environment. Um, we are national, so we cover the whole of the UK, and um, we're a membership organisation, so we have over 40,000 members, um, and we have 32 volunteer-led branches, so those are branches that are in almost every county um, across the UK, including obviously Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, and we rely really, really heavily on um, volunteers, as you'll see, hopefully, throughout this presentation. Um, we do have just we've just hit the 100 mark in terms of numbers of staff um, that we have across the UK, and that includes many highly qualified um, scientists, which actually makes us the world's largest research institution for butterflies and moths, which I just think sounds really really impressive. Um, we have a really small number of nature reserves. That's not really our main focus, but we do have 36 um, nature reserves across the UK. Um, but where we do focus quite a lot of our work is in um, leading and being involved in landscape scale um, conservation projects. So we use our data and our knowledge about butterflies and moths to actually go out and work with landowners, work with um, partners to deliver conservation activity for butterflies and moths. So that's a quick overview about us. Um, but I thought I'd better include kind of some facts about butterflies and moths um, at the beginning to try and make sure that we all know a little bit about them um, before I go into a bit more kind of scientific um, bits and pieces. So we have around 59 different species of butterfly in the UK. Um, obviously this is a very small selection but hopefully you might recognise some of these, hopefully you've seen some of these um, either in your gardens or parks or out in the countryside. Um, and then we have, so there's 59 across the UK, but we actually have 40 of those in Devon. Um, so 40 species of butterfly, really fortunate to have that many species within our county. Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot about that, that would be brilliant, thank you. Um, so we can split our 59 species, and I say we've got around 59 species, um, because those are the species that regularly breed in the UK. We do sometimes have other species that migrate here, they might breed for a year and then they disappear, um, or we have kind of migrant species that get blown over and then they, we don't really know what happens to them, they either go back to where they came from or this is their end destination. Um, but we split those into three different groups. So we've got the habitat specialists at the top. So these are the really, really fussy butterflies. Um, and moths, I should say. But we're just talking about butterflies for now. Um, so all butterflies are fussy. But the fussiest ones are what we call habitat specialists. So these are the ones that rely on um, very particular habitats. Perhaps even those habitats have to be in exactly the right place. They might be um, quite small pockets of habitat, or they might need really large pockets of habitat. Um, and they have very, um, throughout their life cycle, they have very particular requirements in terms of um, being within those habitats as well. Then we've got wider countryside species. So these are the ones that you'd find in your parks and your gardens, um, and also across the countryside. So they are still relatively fussy, but perhaps their food plants are a bit more um, common. So things like nettles and grasses, um, the feeders, the butterfly feeders on them, will be included in this wider countryside um, category. And then we've got regular migrants, so things like painted ladies and clouded yellows, which come over here um, <coughs> from Europe. They breed here and then they go back to Europe. Oh, I don't need to shoot that. There we go. And so in terms of moths, there's a little selection of moths just to show you that they're not all brown and boring or really tiny. Um, we do have some really lovely colourful moths um, and there are 2,500 different species of moth in the UK, of which just over 1,700 have been recorded in Devon. So a huge diversity of moths um, and actually I should say about 100 of those species fly in the daytime as well. So 
Sometimes, perhaps, if you see a butterfly that you don't recognise and you're looking through a butterfly guide and you're not sure what it is, it might be worth looking at the day flying moths. Um, because there are some moths that look very much like butterflies as well. I will come on to that. So what's the difference? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I will come on to that. <laughs> um, so both butterflies and moths belong to this group called Lepidoptera, which hopefully a lot of you have heard of before. Um, but Lepidoptera literally means scaly winged insect. So this is a close-up of an orange tip's under side wing on its underwing. Um, and you can see every single one of these little dots are scales. Um, so essentially it's what gives them their colour, um, it's how they have their pattern, essentially their wings are completely see-through, perhaps a bit like dragonfly, but they've got all these scales on top of their wings that give them that colour and that pattern. And that's the type of stuff that if you've ever touched a butterfly or a moth, I'm sure you will have, you get that kind of powder on your hands, and that is the scales coming off of their wings. And there's lots of different reasons why we think they have those scales. Um, one, obviously, it gives them their colour and their pattern, um, which is for breeding, for camouflage, all of those other reasons. But also, there might be reasons like um, you rarely see moths and butterflies getting stuck in cobwebs, because quite often their scales will fall off and they'll escape. So it may well have uh, something to do with predators as well, avoiding predators. So, to come on to your question, what is the difference between the two? Um, and this is a question that I get asked quite a lot. I'm not sure you're really going to appreciate my answer because actually butterflies and moths are the same thing. Um, in terms of kind of evolutionary history, butterflies are actually moths. They're somewhere between the most basic moths and the most complicated moths. Um, they're kind of in the middle. Um, but in the UK, and actually quite a lot of countries across the world, there are ways of telling the difference between the two, and hence why we call them butterflies and moths. So, the main differences are in their antennae. So you can see here, the butterfly has very neat antennae and has a little kind of clubbed, we call them clubbed antennae, they have a very rounded end to them. Um, whereas the moth, this moth in particular has feathered antennae, so it's got um, what we say thread-like antennae when it's just this kind of string. This is a male moth, so he's got the feathered antennae, which is what he uses to smell um, female pheromones. Um, so that's the main difference, is that butterflies have this neat little lump on the end of their antennae. The other is the way that they rest. Um, so, as you can see in this picture, butterfly, this butterfly, this is a small copper, um, it's basking in the sunshine with its um, wings out, but when it will come to rest, it will close its wings directly behind its back. Um, moths don't really have different ways of resting, there are a few species that rest in different ways, but generally most of them will be quite flat, quite flat to the ground, they don't really move their wings a lot. So this one, it, obviously it can fly, it will fly, and then when it lands it's immediately like that shape. Um, so those are the two main differences. The actual kind of maybe perhaps slightly more scientific difference is that moths have a tiny little hook that joins their two wings on each side together, and that's called a frenulum, and a butterfly doesn't have that. So that's also partly why moths look like they fly slightly differently to butterflies. Butterflies' wings are all independent of each other. A moth would have a little kind of hook here that attaches that wing to this wing. Um, so that's another way. But there is one species in the world that doesn't have that, and it's still called a moth. So it's very <laughs> confusing at times. Um, but hopefully that answers your question in terms of what the difference is, um, at least in the UK. So why are they important? Um, butterflies and moths are obviously part of our natural heritage. They've got quite a, uh, an importance in terms of British culture. A lot of people used to go and collect butterflies. Um, and you can see these are the, the original butterfly scientists here. They've all got their nets. Um, and actually these collections have, been, have given us quite a lot of information, uh, but they've also <coughs> have been detrimental to some species, um, particularly ones that were particularly attractive and some, unfortunately, we did lose some populations through collecting um, back in the day. But butterflies are really, really iconic. We use them as symbols of all sorts of things, and for a lot of people, they bring a lot of joy. When you see a butterfly in your garden, um, or if it just crosses your path, a lot of people notice butterflies because they're bright and colourful. Have you got your... No, no, no sorry. Right. No, <laughs> no, that's right. Um, and obviously, they're very popular. We've even got cakes made that look like butterflies. 
Um, and this is Colin at the bottom here, um, much to MS's dismay, <laughs> other caterpillar case are still available um, in the shops. So, butterflies and moths are also really important parts of our ecosystems um, and food chains. So, well, all life stages really of the butterfly and moth are important um, in terms of uh, what animals eat them. Obviously, we've got birds, more mammals, reptiles, pretty much everything will feed on butterflies and moths in some form or another. And I've just included a little stack here um, where we found that up to 30,000 caterpillars are needed to raise one nest of blue tip chicks. Um, so that's a huge number of caterpillars. And actually, if we if those caterpillars weren't here, I'm not sure we would have as many blue tits either. So they're all kind of interrelated, very important parts of the food chain. They're also really important pollinators. And a lot of people might not think of butterflies and moths as pollinators. Um, but actually, some studies have shown that moths in particular are actually better pollinators than bees are. Um, primarily because a moth doesn't want to collect that pollen. So it quite readily disperses it as it flies from flower to flower. Um, but also there are some flowers that only flower at night, um, which can only be being pollinated by um, moths. And this is just a lovely picture here. This is a small elephant hawk moth, which you would be lucky to get in your garden, but they are in gardens. Um, and this has orchid pollen on its face. So all these little um, things here are uh, pollen from an orchid to just demonstrate that they are going and feeding on these flowers. And actually orchids, most orchids are pollinated by moths just because they've got really long tongues, really long proboscis. Um, that can reach down into those flowers, which a lot of other insects can't do. So they're a very important pollinator. And they're also a really important indicator um, of environmental change. So I'm going to refer to my notes here to make sure I don't get this bit wrong. <laughs> um, so they're, they're recognised as an indicator of environmental change, and we do use them a lot, and we use the, the trends generated from um, but, but, butterfly and moth um, populations for government statistics, for instance, to produce lots of reports, um, and they're a really well-known indicator um, of our environment. And that is mostly because they are governed completely by the weather, um, and in particular temperature. So if it's too cold, adult butterflies and moths, they can't fly, they can't breed, they can't um, lay their eggs. They're really governed by kind of temperature. They need the right conditions. Um, to be able to, to carry out their life stages. And this kind of um, reliance on temperature applies equally to other parts of their life cycle as well. So a too high a temperature can kill eggs and they can actually become dehydrated. So as a result, a lot of our butterfly and moth species are at the edge of their European range within the UK. Um, so lots of the species reach their cold edge, which is being shown here by the gatekeeper. So this is where the gatekeeper is found in the UK, these green spots. Um, but we also have some cold adapted species, so things like the Scotch Argus here, um, that lives in the kind of more mountainous regions, the upland areas. They prefer cooler or they need cooler conditions to be able to breed. Um, so they're actually on their kind of warm edge of their range in the UK. Um, so obviously we're warmer down here and cooler up here. Um, also, butterfly and moth biology enables them to respond really rapidly to environmental changes. Um, so they produce loads of eggs. Uh, populations can increase really rapidly when the conditions are right. Um, and they can fly, so they can disperse to colonise new areas. And obviously they have really short life cycles, so they can react much more quickly to environmental change <coughs> than the kind of longer lived organisms. So they're a really, really great indicator of, of how our environment is doing. But they are in trouble, sadly, and hopefully, well, not hopefully, but I'm sure this is not a surprise um, to you that they are in trouble. So over the last century, we have sadly lost four species of butterfly and over 60 species of moth, so they've become extinct um, within the UK. Um, our most recent report, the State of, butterfly, State of UK's Butterflies Report, has shown us that 80% of UK butterflies have declined in both their range or their abundance. 
over the past 50 years. So that's a massive loss um, of butterflies. And the same, unfortunately, has been found for moths as well. So moth abundance, so that's the overall number of moths, has decreased by 33%. And that is actually we're seeing um, worse declines in the southern areas than we are in the northern areas in terms of moths. Um, so not a good picture at the moment for butterflies and moths. And there's lots and lots of different reasons why that might be. Um, there really is really, really complex picture. It's likely that there's a lot of different factors affecting each species, and each species is probably going to be different. Um, but generally speaking, it's mostly due to habitat loss, and whether that's through um, agricultural intensification, pesticides, um, commercial forestry, the lack of management, also all of the development, urban development and industry as well. And actually, when you look at some of the stats of the habitat loss, it's really, really staggering. Um, we've lost 40% of our broadleaf woodlands, 200,000 miles of hedgerow, 98% of flower-rich meadows. So again, this is why we're seeing these declines uh, in butterflies and moths. And climate change as well is no doubt um, having an impact. And we're starting to generate more information. We're starting to understand how climate change is affecting species. Yeah. What date is this report? Um, so the state of butterflies is 2022, so it came out earlier this year. And the state of moss was 2021, so it would have come out in 2022. So they're really, they're very recent, recent reports. <coughs> Um, so in terms of climate change, <clears throat> we found that there are some species that are contracting. So the Scott Jarvis, which I showed you that little map of, um, a moment ago we are finding that that is starting to contract its range. It's being pushed more northwards um, because it's getting too warm. Or perhaps it's, it's not necessarily that it's um, too warm for its life cycle, but it might well be that we're starting to lose host plants, we're starting to lose food plants because they're being outcompeted by other plants. Um, or it could be factors that there are certain um, climatic conditions that caterpillars need, for instance, or the adults need to be able to successfully breed. Um, so we are finding quite a few species are starting to contract. Um, the host plant example is um, there as well, like I just mentioned, with the wall butterfly. Um, so that one again is quite, I didn't include the map actually, but I wish that I had because it's quite an impressive, not in a good way, map of where the wall was very central and now it's really been pushed to the sides of the, the UK and um, really starting to be pushed out of where it was before. And obviously the more extreme climate events are also not good news for our butterflies. So last year you would have remembered we had a really um, big drought, we had a lot of really hot weather. Um, and that can cause butterfly populations to crash and also extreme winter weather so that we have really cold weather or in some cases really warm weather over the winter. It's that kind of instability that is not good for um, insects. But you'll be pleased to know that that is my last depressing slide. <laughs> so that is the, the depressing part of my talk out of the way. The rest will be a little bit more positive and much more focused on what we can all do because butterflies and moths do need all or as many people as possible to be doing stuff for them. And that actually applies to all wildlife, obviously, because of the things that we've just been talking about. So a positive climate change story <clears throat> um, can be seen in the comma. So the comma, if you're not familiar with it, um, it's the only butterfly in the UK that has this kind of jaggedy edge around its wings. It's very distinctive and it's named after, you can't see it very well on here, unfortunately, but there's a little, um, white mark there that looks like a comma, hence how it's got its name. Um, so the comma in the 1970s was found very much kind of <coughs> um, Britain, but over the years it's been starting to expand and it's been spreading out across the UK, so that's 1999, and then in 2019 it had reached kind of northern Scotland. Um, so the comma is really starting to re uh, expand its range and that's quite, well that's seen um, quite frequently across a lot of the species that are at the colder edge of their range within the UK. They're all starting to so a bit like the gatekeeper that I showed on the previous um, slides. Those are all starting to expand upwards, um, which again suggests that that is a climate, um, it's a climate 
that is affecting them. So, another, how do we know all of that? How do we know all of this um, detail about the declines, um, how all of those graphs that I just showed you, all of those records, um, and it's really all down to citizen science. Um, so we are really, really lucky in the UK that we have a lot of information about butterflies and moths, um, and that's really thanks to long-term, um, or a long tradition, shall I say, of natural history study and recording. And that is ever, like, it's just growing and growing. So today, we've got more people out there counting butterflies and moths than we ever have before. Um, which is giving us all of this really fantastic information that we can start looking at those trends, we can start <coughs> identifying the butterflies that are in trouble and starting to research how we might um, look after them. And so, thanks to all of those people, and some of these people, um, out there doing lots of citizen science, we now have 17 million butterfly records in our database and over 39 million moth records, which is just absolutely fantastic, and the amount of work that has gone into that from just um, people out there telling us what they're seeing is amazing. Um, and I should say, actually, citizen scientists are everyone, so they are, they're volunteers, they're members of the public, um, they're absolutely anyone that has seen a butterfly or a moth and has decided to send their record in um, via one of many schemes which I've listed here. Um, so this is slightly, perhaps a slightly boring slide, um, but this basically shows you all of the different um, recording and monitoring schemes that we run or help to run at Butterfly Conservation. Um, and they are ordered in terms of um, the ones that need the most effort um, and the most take up the most time, all the way down to ones that are really, really simple to take part in and only take a couple of minutes. Um, so the ones at the top here are part of what we call the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme. We mainly use that data to look at abundance, abundance trends and the number of butterflies that is telling us um, what's happening to those. It does also help us with distribution and a lot of our um, really kind of scientific work is based on that database on the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme. Um, so those include things like butterfly transects, which you might have heard of before. Um, those are really quite intensive survey schemes where we ask people to go to the same site every week for 26 weeks across the summer. Um, and also within the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme, we have the wider countryside butterfly survey, which is again a very um, standardised scheme where we ask people to visit particular um, squares and to visit those anywhere between two to five times a year. So not as much effort for the wider countryside butterfly survey, but you do have to visit the square that we tell you to. Um, if they're randomly generated squares, those ones. <coughs> Um, then we come to these kind of bigger schemes, so we have the National Moth Recording Scheme, that is basically where any moth records go. Um, so that could be records that if you're putting out a moth trap in your garden and you send your records to, um, we have a network of county moth recorders, send them to the moth recorders, then they'll end up in the National Moth Recording Scheme. You can also record moths, daytime, uh, day flying moths through any of these schemes actually. Um, about no, I think you can record them on Ira Club Butterflies now as well. Um, so any of those moth records will be feeding into that massive database. That's the 39 million um, moths. Butterflies from the new millennium, you can go straight online and send in just casual sightings. Um, but also all of the records from all of these schemes, apart from moths, go into the butterflies from the new millennium database. So that's our huge 17 million record database. Um, we then have the garden butterfly survey, so this is one where um, it's in a garden, <laughs> in your garden or your allotment or a community garden, um, and this is just recording butterflies as and when you see them or as and when you fancy. Um, so another really, really great scheme, and I'll talk about that a little bit more um, later on. And then finally, we have our two really casual, um, well not really casual, but quite casual uh, schemes at the bottom. So the big butterfly count, hopefully a lot of you would have heard of that before. Um, this is a 15 minute count that we run for three weeks in the summer. Um, and we just ask people to go out with a, a set list of butterflies, the ones that we're, you're most likely to see, and count those butterflies um, within those 15 minutes and send it in to us. And then we've got I record butterflies as well, um, which is again just a really casual, there's an app. 
um, that you can have on your phone and then you can just record any butterflies that you see. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an over, overview of all of the different schemes. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that absolutely anyone can send a record in and we have a scheme that will be right for you. Um, so why does it matter and what do we do with all of this um, data? So ultimately, if we don't know where things are, we can't conserve them. Um, so all of these records, they enable us to see how species are faring in terms of their distribution and abundance. We've spoken about that a bit already. They help us identify conservation priorities. So that is um, how we work out what butterflies and moths are in most trouble um, and which ones should we be spending money on, essentially. Which ones do we need more research on and which ones do we need to intervene and help with. They help us target our landscape work. They help us um, get agri-environment schemes or inform agri-environment schemes and other grants. We can feed into those. Our data goes into them and they um, develop the different schemes. They help designate and manage sites, protection of habitats. And lastly, they help with a lot of scientific research. So we work with lots of universities, lots of students. Um, that are doing very dedicated um, scientific research projects with our data. Um, and that is how we know about things like climate change um, and analysing those kind of declines. So I just wanted to give you a little example going on that theme of every record counts. I wanted to give you an example of how the big butterfly count is actually really uh, benefiting our knowledge. So the big butterfly count is that count that only takes 15 minutes. Um, and you can do it absolutely anywhere. So the Jersey tiger here is my moth of choice for this example. And um, this is quite a large moth. Has anybody seen Jersey tiger yet? Yes. Yes. Not? yes. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> so about 20, 30 years ago, they were actually um, very isolated. They were only just on the south coast. Really small pockets of um, population of Jersey tiger. And they're a moth that will fly in the daytime, so they're quite readily seen once they do um, get out there. But this map here are all of the records that we had in the National Moth Recording Scheme in 2016. Um, so these are the black ones here. And um, because we saw that they were expanding, we thought, oh, we'll add them to the big butterfly count recorder sheet. Um, so that is what we were asking people to go out. We we're asking them to count their garden butterflies, but we also have three moths on there now, one of which is the Jersey Tiger. So in 2022, people went out and they started counting um, Jersey Tigers. They saw a lot, as you can see. So that's all these pink dots here. And when we compare that to the previous chart, we can see, we still see quite a lot of those pink dots. So these are um, records of Jersey Tiger that we had absolutely no idea about before. We didn't know that they were as north as the big butterfly count um, recorders have found, and also that they were spreading in different areas. And as you can see, oh, that just highlights the ones in the, um, in the northern range. So we now know, because of the big butterfly count, that this um, moth is starting to spread across, well, up north, northwards and um, westwards. So really fascinating information and just a really good example of how just one 15 minute count can make a difference um, to our knowledge in some, some of these species. Now most of these records are probably in people's gardens because the majority of people that get involved with the big butterfly count do it in their gardens or their parks. And that brings me quite nicely on to how gardens can help um, butterflies and moths. Yeah, before I carry on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably just a really stupid question, but how do you um, discriminate between actually that's the spreading of the butterfly or just the fact that you put that moth on, or moth rather, on the fact you put the moth on the survey from the same date and then therefore it's being recorded? Yeah, so most of our, all of the big butterfly count um, records also go to county butterfly recorders, so they get verified that way as well. Um, a lot of those would have sent in pictures to, to prove that they were there. Um, but also, they're just a really distinctive moth. So yes, there might be people out there that decide they're just going to tick a random moth and pretend that they saw it. But actually, most of the time, it will be yeah, genuine records um, that are then verified by other experts, if you like. Um, but I think more the fact that it's really very um, identifiable. There's not really anything else that looks like 
Uh, that, but it was a really good question, because obviously that does come into play to some degree with some of the butterflies that look very similar. Yes, it wasn't the identifying one, it was just the fact that you were now asking people to record them, because before you had it. Is that, does that make sense? Do you know what I mean? Oh, what? Was recording. <laughs> a, more people recording, and B, recording different things you're asking them to record, you haven't asked them to record that before, so... Yeah, okay, I see what you mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, although we would have had, so all of those other records, sorry, if I go back one, all of these black one, yeah. black records, okay. um, they are still from people sending in um, iRecord records or um, garden butterfly survey records. And yeah, so you're absolutely right. We've just expanded our audience by asking the big butterfly count people to, to um, record Jersey Tigers. But I think actually that's probably also quite a good point in terms of we can use those group of people then to actually look at, at other species as well and perhaps ask them to look target um, certain species each year. Yes, so gardens. Um, gardens actually cover more than one million hectares of land in the UK, so they're a really, really important green space. Um, and I just wanted to pull out some stats from the recent RHS um, report which showed that in urban areas, gardens can represent 50% of green space, of total green space. Um, but unfortunately, we are losing gardens as well. Um, so they found that in 2005, 7% of UK front gardens were completely paved, but 10 years later, almost 30% of those gardens were then, as gardens were paved. <coughs> I think really what I wanted to do was just highlight how how much gardens can help these species and I'm going to base the rest of my talk on talking about gardens, what we can all do um, and how we can help butterflies and moths in that way. So Butterfly Conservation have launched a brand new program um, last month actually called Wild Spaces. Um, so Wild Spaces is essentially gardening for butterflies but with a catchier name. Um, and what it aims to do is really raise awareness about the importance of looking at the whole life cycle of butterflies and moths. And um, so wild space is defined by um, being able to provide feed, breed and shelter uh, opportunities for butterflies and moths. And they can be absolutely anywhere. So they can be really large spaces, large gardens, they can be really small spaces, whether that's a tiny patch within a garden or whether it's just a pot, for instance, or on a balcony or on a window um, box. So we really, oops, um, so we're, we've got a very ambitious um, strategy to create 100,000 of these across the UK. So we really need everybody to get involved and help out with those. But just to go back a step and revisit the, um, the butterfly life cycle. So this butterfly here is the large white. Um, you might have heard it be called cabbage white before. So cabbage white um, is actually two species, the small and the large white, but they both look very similar and they both feed on cabbages. So people call them cabbage whites. And the large white will lay huge clusters of eggs on cabbages or other brassicas. Um, those eggs will then hatch and they come into obviously tiny little caterpillars and they eat and eat and eat. And in the life cycle, um, caterpillars actually shed their skins about five to six times. This applies to all butterfly and moth caterpillars. And each time they shed their skin, they come out slightly different colour, um, but they're also quite vulnerable at that stage while they're shedding their skin. And then when they're ready, they shed their skin one final time and underneath is that kind of chrysalis or pupil. Um, skin, which is then the uh, chrysalis stage where they're then changing from a caterpillar into a butterfly. And again, talking about British butterflies here, <coughs> um, the majority of butterflies have just one generation, so one brood of caterpillars a year. Um, there are a few, about a quarter, that have two or more broods. And actually that is being affected by climate change to some extent in some species. Some are trying to put in more broods than they were before, um, which may well benefit them in the long term if we warm up fast enough. Um, but if we don't, then actually they're starting to lose out because they're not adapting quick enough. Um, and they're in the wrong stage then for overwintering. Most butterflies and moths overwinter as caterpillars, 57% um, there. And then the next 
um, kind of bigger catteries, I guess, are overwintering as eggs or pupa. And then there's only a really small proportion of adult butterflies that hibernate or overwinter in the UK. And those are all of the butterflies, which should bring a little, oh, I'll show you later. Um, they're all the butterflies that have ever so slightly jaggedy edges on their wings. So things like peacocks, small tortoise shells, comma, um, and brimstone. They'll be overwintering as adults. So thinking about the life cycle and going back to that feed, breed and shelter, um, if we focus first on the, the, the first element, the feed element of um, wild spaces, which applies mostly to adult butterflies and moths, so this is nectar. Now, the majority of butterflies and moths feed on nectar produced by flowers, but there are a few exceptions. So for instance here, the poplar hawk moth, <coughs> he or she sadly doesn't have any mouth parts so they don't eat as an adult moth um, at all. They have quite chunky bodies, they've got a lot of reserves in there, they've eaten a lot of, as a caterpillar and they've stored that up as energy and that's all they need then to survive their adult stage. Again, another example is the vapor and moth female here, that kind of little fluffy blob in the middle there. These two are males, they've got the big antennae. The female doesn't have any wings at all and there are a few species of female moth in the UK that don't have wings. Um, and they literally just emerge where they have pupated. Uh, they have a very boring life, in my opinion. Um, and they just sit around, they wait for a male, and then they lay all of their eggs in the same place and die. So they don't get to feed either, which is a little <coughs> sad. Um, so yeah, the majority of adult butterflies and wasps will feed on nectar. Some do also feed on sap or um, honeydew from trees. And they also, there are some that are quite partial to some rotting fruit in the autumn as well. So if you've got any apples on the ground, it's a good idea to just leave them there. Um, and that's particular, particularly popular with species like the red admiral that are either migrating or they might decide to hibernate here. Now, there are some plants to avoid in your garden if your focus is to um, create habitat for butterflies and moths. So my colleagues call these plastic plants. Um, they're most bedding plants that you find in garden centres. Um, they have as much value as a plastic plant. All they do is provide a little bit of shelter, perhaps, um, to <coughs> insects. Um, they have no available pollen or nectar. So they're things like petunias, begonias, busy lizzies, all of the parasites <coughs> that you see in the garden centre. So, they are very attractive, but sadly they don't produce anything decent. Um, so, like I say, if you expect, this is especially important to think about if you've only got a tiny space and where space is really, really valuable, you might want to choose plants that aren't these ones. Um, the other plants um, to be aware of are ones that actually they might have nectar and pollen, but it's completely inaccessible to insects. So dahlias are quite a good example of this because you get them in lots of different shapes. Um, the ones that are completely closed, obviously an insect is going to have a really hard time getting in, um, into there to find any pollen or nectar that it might have. Um, so those are quite unsuitable if you're growing for butterflies and moths. But actually open dahlias are ones where there is readable, uh, readily available um, nectar and pollen are good for your gardens. Now the really good news is, is if you avoid both of those, then pretty much everything else is good. And there's a huge amount of choice out there for nectar sources. Um, you don't have to stick to just native plants, although obviously native um, does have other benefits as well. Um, but there are a lot of different uh, nectar plants that you can choose from. And the main thing when you're thinking of this kind of feed element is to try and choose plants um, that enable you to have nectar in your garden all year round, or at least for the main periods of when butterflies and moths are active. But there are also things like bumblebees that come out in January, February, if it's a warm day. Um, so you might want to find some things that are flowering really, really early spring or really late um, autumn as well. Um, I'm not going to go through too many of the plants on my slide because I don't have time, but also because they're all listed on our website, which I'll put a link to um, on the last slide. Um, so you can go on there and find all of this information again. And um, herbs are another really, really good plant um, to have. A lot of them are native to the UK, 
Um, so not only do they provide nectar if they're flowering, um, but they're actually also really good food plants for caterpillars. Um, and there are lots of different sorts of caterpillars that will feed on various different types of herbs. So that's another really good one. If you've only got a really tiny space, or say a window box, then herbs are a good choice. Also, they smell really nice, don't they, when you walk past them. And you can eat them yourself, so win-win. Um, so that takes us on to the breed element of wild spaces. Um, so breed, this is now referring to eggs and caterpillars. Um, so most uh, species prefer native plants, they've evolved to seek them out to lay their eggs on. So for instance, um, peacocks or tortoise shells, they'll be looking for nettles to lay their eggs on. Um, that's what their caterpillar eats. But sometimes those plants have to be in particular growth stages. So taking the nettle example, they don't want nettles that are in the shade, they have to be in the sun. Um, because the sun warm, warms up the caterpillars, the caterpillars can feed faster, they can pupate quicker and become a butterfly quicker. Um, so they will seek out whether that is true for the future or in really hot years, we'll have to see if they might start choosing the shady, shady areas. And then I'm running out of time a little bit, I think, so I'll flip over the, uh, the next example. Um, but also, there's lots of different food plants, again, that you can choose that will help caterpillars. And this is really, I can't emphasise this enough, I don't think, but the caterpillar stage is really, really key. So you can have loads of nectar and you can be attracting a few butterflies in, but if there's nothing for them to lay their eggs on and nothing to help support their caterpillars, then actually they're not going to be hanging around for very long. So again, all of these plants are on our website. Trees and shrubs are also really good if you've got space, um, especially for moth caterpillars. Um, and the bonus of choosing native trees and shrubs is they also have flowers, quite a lot of them have flowers, which provide nectar, and they're really good sources of shelter as well, um, which brings us on to the shelter element of wild spaces. So shelter can be as simple as um, hedges, trees, um, for well, all life stages really, but in terms of the adult butterflies and moths, obviously they need somewhere to go on wet, windy days, um, and that can be great shelter for them. It's actually really, really easy to provide shelter as well because there's lots of lips on pots, under pots, window sills, there's all sorts of places they can go. Um, in my garden, I actually have a Leylandii hedge, which isn't ideal, but I've got flats opposite that I don't want looking in. Um, and in the summer, I'll see butterflies in, as it's getting dark at dusk, coming in, flying in, and they'll be roosting up within my Leyland and <coughs> um, using as that as shelter overnight. And then we've just got a couple of hibernating species down here as well. Um, they tend to use garages or sheds or wood, wood piles, things like that. So again, with shelter, it's really important to think about all of the life stages. So here we've got an orange tip um, Chrysalids stay over winter as a pupa, so you could be quite tempted to just chop this down and burn it. Um, but actually, if you are chopping stuff down, if you can and you've got the space to, it's better to just leave it in a little pile in a quiet corner of the garden, just in case things like orange tip are there. Um, there are a few other kind of tips and hints as well, and lots of that is on, also on our um, website. And finally, I just wanted to talk really, really briefly about meadows because this is probably what a lot of people ask about in terms of how do you let your grass grow long and it actually be valuable. Um, so the first kind of step in terms of if you are deciding to just leave your lawn to grow a little bit longer is to just let it grow and see what comes up. And actually, if you're finding that you don't have any flowers and um, you've just got those kind of thicker grasses, they're really deep green in colour, they're quite shiny, that means you've got really, really high fertility um, soil and what you want to do is try and make that less fertile. So if you're starting at that stage, you might want to just cut it three times a year. Always take off the cuttings and um, that is the crucial part because the cuttings are the things that are adding more fertility to the soil and you want less fertility, less grass to allow the flowers to grow. Um, but once you've done that, then you can follow these steps here. Um, so it's a case of just cutting them, uh, cutting the, the grass low in the autumn, ideally trying to create a few bare patches if you want to get more flowers in there, sowing some perennial wildflower seed, there's loads of different mixes out there now, some really great um, lawn, uh, flowering lawn mixes. 
Um, and then just cutting that once a year. Um, and it doesn't have to be a big area. It can just be a tiny little one, one metre squared or something um, area. And that will hopefully produce lots more flowers, lots more nectar, but also there's a lot of butterfly species and moth species that feed on grasses as caterpillars. So the longer grass will also do them a lot of good. And a few general tips, I'm sure you're aware of these already, just avoiding things like pesticides, um, trying to get more of your natural predators in there, um, so by creating compost heaps or log piles for things like amphibians and reptiles, and then obviously using these free compost, which thankfully is a lot easier to do nowadays than it was a few years ago. And like I say, there's lots more information on our website, which can be found here, wildspaces.co.uk. Um, I do have a little plea before I'm finishing, <laughs> which is, so our Wild Spaces website went live last month. I think I've got a yeah, little map here. And this is a map that sits on the Wild Spaces website. There's lots and lots of information on there, but what you can also do is tell us what you are doing for butterflies and moths, or the Wild Spaces that you might already have or are going to create. Um, and you can go onto the website and it's really, really simple. You can just click the box, I think it says create a wild space. Um, you can put absolutely any space on there. There's loads and loads of different choices from small garden, large garden, to pots, to schools, to roadside verges, lots of different options. Um, and you can add yourself to the map. Now I did have a sneaky look this morning and there are no dots for Sigma yet. <laughs> so I'm going to give you all a challenge to go away. In fact, the closest to Sigma is my allotment, <laughs> which is in New Hoffman, so not too far. Um, <clears throat> but it would be really great to get some more um, wild spaces recorded and registered on there. And like I say, you'll then receive all of that information, what's relevant to you, what you can do in your um, space and in your garden. Now, I haven't tried this before, but I have left a little QR code here, and that will take you directly to the Wild Spaces website. So if you have um, a smartphone and you want to go straight onto the Wild Spaces right now, hopefully you can just walk up to the screen and scan it, and it might work. Uh, but if it doesn't, then I've got a better version on the screen here. Um, and yes, that's going to be about it from me. Sorry I rushed the last little bit. I'm conscious of the time. I knew I would over.